All right, how y'all doing today? So in my notes it says good morning, but I'm going to go off script and say good afternoon because it's actually after, afternoon now. Sorry for the delay, and, uh, but I see y'all got your food now, and, and we're happy to have y'all here. I hope you can stay a few extra minutes beyond one because I think it's going to be a great conversation, and we're going to go a little bit over probably. So, um, so welcome to the Virginia Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. I'm Bob McKenna. I'm the president and CEO, and I see several new faces in the crowd who I have not yet met. So please get one of my cards, and let's go get coffee. And that's what I do. I like to sit down and have coffee and build relationships. So, so please, before you leave, uh, either grab one of my cards in the back or come see me and introduce yourself if I haven't already met you. Um, I'd like to consider you a partner in making a better community and a better economic forecast for our area. So, so I'd like to welcome you all to the third part of a, thir a three-part series, which may actually become a five-part series. Is that right, Shelley? called Developing the Talent Pipeline. As I'm sure you've all heard, the key to economic growth is talent, talent, and talent. Big business is more likely to expand in and move to regions that have a solid pipeline of talent. We believe that we have some great sources of talent here on the peninsula and in the 757, including transitioning service members and their families, kids coming out of our local schools and going right into the workforce, and university grads, whether they be our own children who have gone away and then come back, or graduates of the local universities who have gone away from home and we keep them here. So the key in all those cases is retention. How do we retain this great young talent and these future leaders? And if you have an answer to that conundrum, my email is bob.mckenna at vpcc.org. But we have brought in an all-star panel today to help us explore potential solutions. And we also have Elisa Kreider on hand to give us a quick update on Envision 2020, the regional branding initiative, which in large part is about attracting and retaining our future business leaders. Now let me introduce and thank our presenting sponsor, Bank of America. Jerry Quindoza is a banking professional with extensive experience in commercial banking and wealth management. He connects businesses with annual revenues of five to 50 million to all of Bank of America's capabilities so they can succeed in every step of their financial journey. And Jerry, Jerry's sitting right here right now and he's thinking, this is my LinkedIn bio, <laughs> and it is. Jerry always advocates for his client's best interests and he truly believes that if you invite people in your life who do not act, think, or look like you, you may find that they will challenge your assumptions and make you grow and become a better person. Most importantly of all, Jerry is a graduate of LEAD Peninsula class of 2019, which he considers the best class ever. And because he's a great sponsor, I agree for today. Okay, over to you, Jerry. Well, thanks again, Bob. It's. Um really um, an honor for Bank of America to be uh, the title sponsor for um, this, uh, this luncheon today um, in a great topic. Um, I am probably a, a bad example, if you will. You know, I graduated from ODU uh, back in 1989, and then my very first job was a, a management trainee for First Virginia Bank, which is a regional bank, you know, in Falls Church, Virginia. So, so I left the area, if you will. You know, I went to Northern Virginia, and went to the dark side, if you will, and lived there for 15 years. You know, I did. So I didn't come back to the real Virginia until you know after 15 years later. So, this is really a good, you know, a good uh, forum here to kind of talk about how we could retain and acquire talent here locally. Uh, keep the talent that we have. We've got some really great universities and schools here um, in Hampton Roads, as you all know. You've got ODU, obviously, Norfolk State on the other side. Um, and then, of course, here you've got CNU, Hampton University, William & Mary. We've got really great uh, community colleges as well. You know, so, you know, how can we retain and, and acquire talent here and, and keep the good folks here? I know here at Bank of America, you know, we've got a perfect example. I think Zach here is, is a local guy, went to ODU, and is now working here locally. He's uh, in the uh, development program at Merrill Lynch, so we need more of him. So, um, so I know, again, it's, it's a good, 
good conversation today, and we're really, well, I'm really looking forward to it. And again, Bank of America is, is really a proud sponsor of, of this, this event today. So I'm going to go ahead and give it back to, uh, to Bob. Thank you. OK, now I'm going to introduce Elisa Kreider. Elisa is Director of Investor Relations and Development at Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance, also known as the Alliance. As such, she handles the organization's investor relations efforts and serves as a liaison between the Alliance and its public and private sector investors. She is also an original board member and founder and two-year chairwoman of Thrive. And she's a co-viz biz millennial on the move and top 40 under 40 recipient. She is here today in her capacity as a member of the Project Task Force for Envision 2020 and the person who is now responsible for moving that initiative forward. Ladies and gentlemen, Elisa Kreider. Thank you, Bob. You can call me a quarterback. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Raise your hand. I just want to get a feel for the audience. If you were at the Chamber's annual meeting or if you've already seen one or two presentations on Envision 2020. Okay. All right. Maybe a third? Not bad. Not bad. Great. So I hope you all learned something today. This was a 120-page uh, PowerPoint, but I've got it down to about 20 slides. So I'm giving you the cliff notes. Um, and bear with me as I change the slides this way. Uh, but basically, Envision 2020 is a branding initiative. OK? Um, it has been a 10-month-long uh, process that now is turning into about a year and a half, two years. It, it's ongoing, and it has been an honor to serve in this capacity, along with um, 29 other uh, folks uh, from the region. Uh, so we had three different groups. We had our key group um, that met every month on this, and then we had a large group of stakeholders, which I believe a lot of you attended those events. And then we just had the region as a whole. There were so many different ways we were engaging folks throughout this process, uh, but it was definitely a research-based process. So I'm gonna take you through. Okay, there it changed. Okay, so what's important to know, envisioning2020.com is where you can find so much more information. So if I don't cover something or you have questions, please use this as a resource. Uh, we, gosh, had probably over 10 or 12 surveys that were completed, so you can get all the information right here on this site. So let's set the story straight. 757 is so much more than an area code. I know we all saw the recent news where 948 is coming, but y'all, that is about two years out, and it's going to be the new people that come to this area that don't already have a 757 number like us, um, very few and far. Um, what's important to know is 757 has been our area code since 1996. That's a long time. I won't tell you how old I was then. Um, but anyhow, it's, it's important to know that 757 is so much more than an area code, it really transcends that. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So the truth of the matter is we are not changing our name to 757. I know there was some confusion from the story in the pilot about that. Really, we want to embrace all of our names, whether it's Hampton Roads, Tidewater, Coastal Virginia. There are several great companies around this region that use all three different names, and they're all appropriate. And we want people to continue doing that because it's whatever you connect with. But 757 is simply uh, something that ties us all together. It's, it's one thing that all the 17 jurisdictions have in common uh, and brings unity. So this is something that just will enhance each and every one of these formal names. So there's three conclusions that came out of our research. So I'm going to talk about those real quick. Conclusion number one, the Hampton Roads region does not have a naming issue. It has a marketing issue. Conclusion two, what's needed now is a regional pride building effort that pulls us together in a way where we can effectively share our story. And three, we should empower our young people to lead the way their energy and success will attract the future talent our region needs to grow and thrive. We have a retention issue and we, we want to fix that. We want more young professionals moving to this area and we want the wonderful young professionals that are here graduating from our amazing institutions to stay here and not leave for Austin or Charlotte or all, all these other attractive cities. 
So again, the pilot got it wrong. <laughs> where they crossed off all those names, they really honestly should have been check marks because all of those names are very much still appropriate. So if you take anything from this today, I want you to know it's fine to still be Hampton Roads, Coastal Virginia, all those great names, but 757 is merely a pride building campaign. So when we asked in the survey, what are the first three things you think of when you hear the name 757? This is a wordle, so it's really interesting. Words like Hampton, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, beach, home. Those were the words people said. You see how infrequently area code popped up. They don't really think of 757 as an area code. All these other names come to mind first. So we thought that was pre really pretty interesting. Well, then we thought, well, what if we got this down to just young professionals? Would this change if we just take the, like, you know, um, really 40 and younger? What would it look like? And I can share this with you. Um, so look, it's even smaller. It's even smaller. Gosh, they're naming cities, fun, home, family. All these wonderful words are popping up way more frequently. And that's because they were very young in 1996. Okay, and so, you know, it's always been 757 for them. Um, and it's, you know, so I know in high school, I had it in my AIM screen name. It was kind of cool. We had hand signals, all this stuff. So 757 was just how we identified with this area. It was so much more than just a phone number. So let's go ahead and talk about how we're going to harness the potential of a regional branding campaign. So from the survey, again, I want to highlight a few things people said when uh, they heard about 757 um, as their preferred informal name. Uh, they said everyone identifies already with the 757. It represents all cities, all communities, lifestyles, et cetera, in the region. It's geared towards a younger generation. It more closely incorporates the entire area over the other names. And we take pride in people and accomplishments connected to the 757. So a lot of really positive things. OK, so this is really interesting. We were able to do some research and find out just what all the jurisdictions are um, paying in their marketing, in their economic development, in their tourism. And it's like over $50 million. But if you recognize the 17 jurisdictions, it's kind of hard to find like Hampton Roads written on their site. It may be there, but it's certainly not on there as a, a banner or, you know, an icon on the main page. It's kind of tucked away. Um, some cities, we couldn't even find it at all. So I think that was an issue. Although Hampton Roads um, is wonderful, and I, I, I still say I'm from Hampton Roads, I think it just wasn't properly marketed. And that's why it's hard for regions outside of this area to identify where it is. In fact, 15% of people um, weren't, um, were the only ones that could identify exactly where it was. That was kind of low. So what we're looking to do, um, and again, this is the quick, quick version, so I'm happy to share more information, um, is this uh, pride building campaign for the next six months. Really, it'll probably go into a year. Uh, but we're going to go to local high schools, already have colleges, next generation groups. We're going to build and launch the 757 website that will be a centralized branding resource for cities. Because really, what we want is all the cities to have that proud 757 badge on their website, just showing unity and how they're connected to the other 16 jurisdictions in this area. Um, and then we want it be uh, you, it wants we want it to be a resource. We want there to be beautiful pictures, imagery, videos, things that they can just grab and pull. Uh, positioning statements for when they're needing to market this to an outside business from another area. So just really a resource. We didn't make this up. Columbus is doing it really well. They have awesome branding. If you want to go check out their websites, everything looks uniform. Um, of course, with them being the capital. Uh, the star, but also us, because they are very just all about us, and it's just their branding's beautiful. So we really look to them as just one example, but we had six or seven that we followed closely. So then we create our own, so everyone can celebrate the 757. And then I mentioned some positioning statements. It's important for us all to be 
um, saying the same story. And so um, think about it. Like, let's say you're the Chrysler Museum of Art and you have a new exhibit and the New York Times calls and you're so excited to talk up this exhibit. But then you also need some information in your back pocket to explain why Hampton Roads, Coastal Virginia, 757, is so wonderful. Why is this area so wonderful? So if we are able to talk um, intelligently and explain our area and we're all saying the same story, that's going to put us on the map. That's going to help people really understand, wow, Hampton Roads, it's somewhere to go visit. Shoot, I might even want to move there. It's, it's got it going on. So how are we going to do this? Okay, I mentioned phase one. It's going to be probably a couple years, okay? Not everyone is going to all of a sudden just throw 757 on their company website, change their logos, all that. We don't even really need a lot of that to happen, but we want this to kind of be like guerrilla marketing where you just kind of start to see it. And where this has worked really well, and I can give an example that's close by, would be Richmond with RVA. So what did they do? They got a bunch of bumper stickers. They started putting it on their cars. And all of a sudden, Chesterfield, who used to be like, I am never going to be called seven, or I'm never going to be called RVA. Now they're embracing it and they love it. And they have the stickers on their cars too. So who knows? Maybe we could do seven, five stickers and have each jurisdiction written on there. So seven, five, seven, Hampton, seven, five, seven, Virginia Beach, all that, just so you can connect with it. You, we've all seen the big love signs and RVA signs. It's another great way. You know, let's, let's have a 757 sign that can float around the different jurisdictions and get pictures with it. It's just fun, you guys. It's a, a pride-building campaign. Uh, we also want a little help from our friends. So when we told Pharrell Williams' assistant about this, and we actually got with him as well, um, he was extremely excited and supportive, which we were thrilled because we didn't know w what direction he would go. But that makes a lot of sense because thinking back, he has used 757 a lot in his marketing with something in the water. So we're currently working with Pharrell's team right now to uh, make a really cool campaign out of this and get businesses, could be your business, involved with something in the water and 757. Call yourself a 757 founder. Uh, so we're really, really excited for this package. It's being put together as we speak. And uh, stay tuned. And if you want more information on it, please let me know. We're very excited to get lots of businesses involved and get your brand out there. So just to kind of summarize, uh, the 757 campaign will be funded by regional leader businesses and organizations in the 757. It's got to be internal at first. Um, they're going to show their support. Uh, we have a couple different sponsorship packages. One will be about 25K, but there's other options as well. And then the Alliance, which is where I work, we're kind of, since we represent 11 of the 17 jurisdictions, we're kind of the home for this. It, it made the most sense at the time. And so we're going to be spearheading this effort. Um, so again, if you want more information, certainly please reach out. I have plenty of business cards. Um, and so basically we want to kind of launch this with something in the water. Uh, but there's so much more that comes after that as well, which we can sit down and talk to you about. Um, so that is think all the slides yeah I brought today uh, but really at this point if I may maybe two questions Bob maybe one and a half, maybe one and a half questions <laughs> okay yes sir it's a great question so when you're yeah Exactly. We're going more with the 757, and the reason for that is when you're writing it in narrative and uh, social media, anywhere, it kind of makes sense to have hashtag the 757. We all know you can't hashtag a number. So um, having the is, is kind of important with it. So great question. Great question. Okay, another ha have a question back. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Sure.
Great questions, great questions. So the chamber and reInvent Hampton Roads, I think did a pretty fabulous job getting a very diverse group together. Like I mentioned, we only had 30 on the task force um, because obviously when you're having monthly meetings, you, you can't be but so big or you're gonna just have people drop off. So we had 30 extremely dedicated people. Um, and then I think they did a great job incorporating everybody um, during those stakeholder meetings. Now we couldn't make people show up. so. You know, although there was the effort to invite a very, very diverse audience from 17 locales, you can't wake them up and make them come to the, the meetings and all that. But I think we did a pretty good job getting people there that we could, so it was a diverse group. And then I think your other question was about, like, why this now? Okay, so I think what's important, and I didn't mention, is um, the reason we didn't go with a coastal Virginia or Hampton Roads Okay, and I think that'll help frame the question. So when we put this out in a survey, oh my gosh, it was so divisive. The business community by far liked coastal Virginia, okay? But I will mention a lot of people on the peninsula did not, okay? That was interesting and good to know. And then Hampton Roads was favored by residents, a lot of residents. But in other words, if we had selected just one of them, oh my goodness, it would have just divided us even further. And that is the exact opposite of what this initiative is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring unity and bring us together, not divide us and make us mad. So we determined that at this point in time, it's too premature to force a formal name and say, goodbye Hampton Roads, it's coastal Virginia or, or vice versa. So that is why we're merely going with a pride building campaign. That's not to say in a couple years from now, we might not become coastal Virginia or another name. That could happen. But right now, we need to fix some issues that are happening in this region that need addressing. We need to get on the same page and collaborate. Okay, sea level rise issues, for example, flooding issues can't be solved by one little group. We need to collaborate and put all the brains together. And things like this, pride building campaigns will help in that, uh, getting us all on the same page. So I. I hope that somewhat addresses your question, but happy to talk more after after this. My time's up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. <clears throat> okay, without any further ado, we're gonna go into the panel, and let me introduce the panel moderator. Uh, President and CEO of Premier Rapport, Program Chair of Peninsula Sherm, Culture Curator, Author, Speaker, Talent Optimizer, Moderator Par Excellence, co-host of Peninsula Biz Buzz, which is the podcast for the Peninsula Chamber, and most importantly, my friend, Shelly Smith. Over to you, Shelly. Thank you so much. How y'all doing? All right. Well, I'm super excited to be here and facilitating today, but let's get to the panelists because they're the ones with all the goods. I'm going to have them introduce themselves quickly. I'm gonna to toss a question out to them individually, and then we're gonna bring it to you guys to see what kind of questions you have. We have a whole litany of others if you go quiet on me, but my gut says you're not gonna go quiet on me. So with that, I'll start here with Angela. Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. Is it on? No, it's not. Oh, that's right. Nope, go ahead. And this one. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Okay. Um, well, hello, my name is Angela Nealon. Um, I am an HR generalist with Virginia Premier. Okay. Um, I also serve on the Pen Peninsula Sherm as the president, and then I also serve on the state council um, as a director for social media. So I will be taking some pictures and I will be posting these throughout the platforms, and I hope that you visit them and tag them all. Hi, I'm Holly Wilson. I work for WM Jordan Company. We're a local construction manager. I have been there for 15 years. Eight of those years, I have been John Lawson's right hand. Um, I'm senior executive assistant, so in addition to helping John, I'm also the liaison to the employees of our company. I run our Newport News, News Region uh, Fund Committee, and um, I also plan all of our corporate events, and um, aside from that, I'm on the Emerging Leader Society through United Way, their um, steering committee. Good afternoon. My name is Casey Roberts. I'm the executive director for New Horizons Regional Education Centers. We service the 23 high schools on the peninsula. We are owned and operated by the six school divisions on the peninsula, and we service 2,700 K-12 students and adult learners uh, annually. 
Um, I serve on the Governor's Commission for STEM Education, um, and I'm in my second year in my role as Executive Director. Hey, I'm uh, Bo Garner. I'm a partner with PB Mayors and also our leader of our nonprofit team. Um, PB Mayors is a regional CPA firm. I think we're number 85 in the nation. We have uh, eight offices in Virginia and two in Maryland. Um, born and raised in the 757 and uh, still here and got my MBA from William & Mary. I did go to Richmond briefly for an undergrad at Randolph-Macon. Um, on Emergent Leader Society, um, involved pretty heavily um, in the community as well. Um, We'll actually stay with you, Bo. So um, when everybody was arriving, we were having a conversation, and Bo brought up a recent article that he had read, and the conversation was around one of my favorite topics. So, Bo, why don't you frame the article and weigh in on it? Well, let me precede that by saying, uh, unlike most millennials, I've only had one job my entire life. I started with my firm um, when I was a senior in college, and now I'm a partner there. Um, and one thing that our uh, CEO, Alan Witt, told me when he interviewed me as an intern was discussing why people switch jobs. And it's about um, loyalty and directly related to their supervisor. If you're not pleased with your supervisor, you're going to leave for a lower paying job, for a, a job that you could get hurt at. If you're not happy with your supervisor, you will leave nothing else is is more important well i read an article that came out in inside public accounting which is the leading um magazine or um publication for accounting firms and in reading that the january 2020 edition the headline article was about why people leave and stay with a cpa firm and i think it's true across any industry or any business and they said the exact same thing my CEO said to me 13 years ago when I started with my firm. And, and that is the loyalty of a supervisor, loyalty to a supervisor. Um, we take a whole lot of pride in beating industry averages in turnover at CPA firms, much like financial institutions and a lot of other um, industries that I see out here. Turnover is kind of uh, second nature. And, and we take a lot of pride in retaining our employees by having them matched properly with their supervisor. Personalities, and we invest very heavily in resources and leadership programs and sending our people managers nationwide to get the best training to manage people because without the talent, we're not gonna have businesses and people are gonna leave for, for other reasons. So I, I just can't emphasize enough, aside from everything else that you're gonna hear today, um, about attracting and retaining talent. Um, the one thing that I really want to emphasize is retention is related to an employee's overall satisfaction with their direct supervisor. Love it. I want to add that um, an article that came out, uh, Harvard Business Review, talked about the training of managers. And actually, Casey, this is going to tee you up for the next question. But the article talked about what is the average length of time that the first time when you're promoted, when you actually get leadership development training, and who wants to guess on how many years on average before you actually get training? Anybody want to guess? Five. Seven. Seven. That's seven years too late. We so often promote our loyal employees and we don't prepare them and we set them up for failure and then things go sideways. So seven years is seven years too late. Just a food for thought. If you want to keep and attract, you, you've got to invest in them. So Casey, I know you had another one, but I, I want to uh, pivot because I know you're prepared for this too. Um, what are some things that either from a personal standpoint or from your vantage point from what it is that you do that companies need to do from a developmental standpoint? And I use the word developmental instead of management because management kind of holds us in. Development explodes the momentum out. So are there tips and tricks around that? With me being a, an educator, and I want to preface all of this too, I'm a millennial. I'm from the 757. I graduated from Hampton High, so I'm, I, I stayed in this area, but I live in Chesapeake, so I kind of go back and forth. Um, 
from a developmental standpoint, from my experiences as an educator, um, there was nothing that could have prepared me to take over a classroom with 30 kids. Uh, when I went to Virginia Tech, I was in the Corps of Cadets. I did leadership training, formalized leadership training for four years while I was at Tech. Um, and I think that, that that particular training of developing um, the internal uh, fortitude, the internal uh, capacity um, to lead people, to understand people and to understand human nature it is essential. Um, and from a standpoint of a teacher, what, we, what I find in the classroom is when we hire brand new teachers or career switchers is that they're really not prepared. And what I try to do is prepare them to deal with the day-to-day -day human interaction. It's not necessarily the work per se, but it's about um, influencing people to get them to a goal and to accomplish something. Um, and that requires uh, the leadership when it comes to mentorship. So if you have a very robust mentoring program and developing the person from the ground up in the core values of an organization, then you're going to get that talent that you're looking for and you get that loyalty factor and you eliminate the I, I, I hate my boss type mentality. I love my boss if they come, they focus on mentoring the next generation or mentoring people around you. Beautiful. So, so far you've heard two core things that are applicable regardless of industry and regardless of age point and generation. It's take care of your people, have real conversations through mentor programs, development programs, and just true compassion and caring that you're glad they're there and they're being seen, valued, and heard. This isn't rocket science, but it's things that we don't do on a consistent basis that absolutely we all need and you're hearing our panelists say as well. So let me switch gears a little bit. We've attracted we're retaining, uh, we haven't attracted yet. We're actually retaining, we're developing. Holly, let me come over to you. Um, you had an interesting conversation. You talked about, you know, how can we better attract? So from a regional standpoint, we're putting ads out there. You know, we're going into Northern Virginia. We're trying to pull people back. Maybe we're going into the San Francisco market. What do, what do all the employers need to do differently to actually attract? Well, with our, so last year, uh, WM Jordan, we've seen exponential growth uh, thanks to the investments that are happening within our communities. And so last year we had hired the most amount of people than we ever have. We hired uh, almost 40 people. Um, and one of our uh, recruitment tactics with our digital marketing specialist is he uh, marketed the region of where the job was posting. For instance, we have uh, job opportunities down in the Carolinas. We have some in the western part of the state. We have some here in Hampton Roads. And so he factored that in. It's not, yes, the video contains about the culture, the amazing culture of WM Jordan, but also the surrounding area because we're trying to pull them in and, and make it a place that they can call home. Love it. So we didn't tee that up on purpose on behind <laughs> yes. the 757, but it's definitely a relevant piece because we all want the balance and who wants to live in a yucky environment and go to work and come home to someplace you think is not fun and is not home. So clearly advertising, if you're not doing that branding wise, it's something that you can do to, you know, to step up your game. And I will now add that you obviously could reach out to you to get some tidbits Absolutely. that could be synced and maybe some uh, uh, keywords that are going to be used. The kind of help on that search piece could be an easily added value to help you from attracting and marketing because we know the labor force the market is fierce out there and you have to differentiate yourself I, I, yes. one more note about that yeah. um so the the saying it's better to stay out of trouble than or to get out of trouble than stay out of trouble um you know same goes with companies um, investing in intern programs and keeping that talent we have so many amazing universities with odu and cnu and hampton university um, Investing in an internship program within your company and growing that individual from their first while they're in college, and then that is going to encourage retainment as well. Uh, your internship, we have a lot of amazing internship programs uh, across our region. Absolutely. Plus, it allows the employer to put the stamp on the employee and to groom it the way you want to groom it. Um, I have the pleasure of working with uh, PB Mayors, and one thing that they say internally is the PB Mayors way. So, creating your own onset of your own language is another way to kind of keep people into that as well. So, now we've talked about supervisors, we've talked about some environment and development, we talked about some regional branding. Let's talk about some specifics from maybe the benefits that would attract and or uh, 
keep or retain. So Angela, we've talked before about that, actually with, with Bob when we were talking about kicking this off. Enlighten us, because you've got some good stuff. I think I have some good stuff. Um, but first of all, I'm, I'm very impressed with the panel, Sarah. I'm completely blown away. Um, I'm not from the 757. I know everyone is shocked. So I actually came here about six years ago, and I like to say that my uh, husband made that decision, but it really was a, a joint decision there. Um, but what I've found is that, you know, talent of the future wants something different than every other generation. Every generation is different. So you have to consider that when you're looking at your benefits. We've got five generations in the workforce. What is everyone asking for? How are we gonna cater to that? And my experience, I know that I'm looking for, now that I'm a mother and I've got all these other things going on, I'm looking for flexibility. I'm looking for the ability to work where I can work that makes most sense for me. Um, I'm looking for managers who are going to understand my situation and work with me and be able to find that compromise or an accommodation to make it work. Um, so flexibility is a big thing and I know that a lot of organizations talk about it. Remote work, I know it scares some people, it scares some organizations. How am I going to monitor those employees who are working remote? How am I going to keep them engaged? How am I going to keep them motivated? But it's possible, you just have to figure out like how is that going to work with your individual organization. It might not work for every position but it can work for some. So I would suggest that you evaluate the positions that you have and determine, can these roles really afford to work remote? And how can I manage a remote team? How can I keep them engaged? Because it is hard. Um, so flexibility is one thing I, I would say is the biggest thing there. Um, and then technology too, um, we rely a lot on email um, and phone calls. So I would suggest, you know, we've moved into um, a lot of video calls, a lot of video conferencing, like IMs. Um, I text my team on the occasion as well, um, including after hours, just to see what's going on, just to check on them, see what's happening. So I would, you know, I would look at what you're using for technology too, um, and just try to incorporate that in some of your day-to-day -day operations. You know, it can't just always be IMs or emails or meeting in person. You might want to do video if you have a remote team. Um, and make it easy for them and make it accessible for them. So those are two of the things that really come to mind in terms of flexibility and remote work and technology. Beautiful. Um, I'll add to that, um, there's more and more messaging from a communication standpoint from senior leaders, from owners, from the C-suite of doing live stream videos. Like today, we're doing live stream on the YouTube channel for the Chamber. So doing more of this, you're even seeing commercials like this. I think it's, I don't know if it's Verizon or Cox that's doing it. So I'm sorry if there's Verizon or Cox in here. I've gotten you messed up. But you can see the guy up on the telephone pole who's doing a repair and they're piping in to the CEO message of the week. And so there's great ways to the technology play that pulls in those perceivable remote workers into a very close knit environment. And it's now, it's expected. And so I'll, I'll talk from an, an old gal um, and an older Gen X. And what used to be norm for me is not norm now. Flexible work schedule is now not like, oh, that is so cool. It's a norm, it's a norm, it's an expectation. So being able to get on board with some things that are normal and kind of shifting your gear will obviously help you retain and attract as well. So let's go out to the audience. I know you guys have some questions. And so let's pull, pull in who wants to ask first and I'll pass the mic. I'll pick on somebody that I know will talk. <laughs> Hey, Adam Duncan, Christopher Newport University, Sluter School of Business. So we work primarily with Gen Z for the iGen. It's got a bunch of different names right now. We're seeing millennials kind of leaving the traditional college age. So there's really two distinct populations that I see every day. They're very, they see the world very differently. They're sensitive to different things. I don't feel like I've heard a lot about where Gen Z fits into all of these plans yet. And I'm curious if that's too soon or if your organizations and your communities have thought about that or have a, a plan for that, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Who's going to pipe in? Yay, Holly. So I, I can speak for my company. And so, you know, we come from a typical traditionalist 
uh, mentality and the investment in social media and our social media presence. When we hired those individuals last year, most of them were, um, well, probably about half of them were under, under 40, maybe even under 35. And I think about 100% of those went to our web page or our website, went to our social media to see what's our culture like. And, and really, that is what is going to attract them to you, I feel like, is, is they're going to buy into your culture. They're going to figure out that, you know, what's the mission, what's the job I want to do, um, but it's the culture. You know, John told his kids when, uh, and he, ha he has one in college and then two that have graduated, and he, he told his kids that, you know, don't look for a job, look for a company. And I think that's the trend you're going to see is more and more people looking for a company that they want to make their life's work uh, more so than just looking for that job or that pay. And I'll add to that because um, I work with the Gen Z and the next generation after Gen Z. Um, what I've noticed is that most Gen Zs are not chasing the dollar. They're chasing for a quality of life and they're willing to trade quality of life for the dollar. I've also seen an increase in the entrepreneurship skills where they're going to go in business for themselves because they, they have seen the destructive nature of chasing the dollar in other generations and they don't want that for themselves. Um, however, with the Gen Z students, there's a lot of pressure on them and, and that's why you see an increase in social, social emotional issues and challenges in schools and at homes um, because they are really trying to find their place in society and they, they do not fit. There is not a space for them. So they're, they're basically eking out and trying to carve out a spot for themselves and waiting for baby boomers and Gen Zs to finally leave the workforce so they could become the new millennials. They really look up to millennials, um, but for millennials, we tend to chase the dollar. They chase the quality of life. And that's what I'm seeing all the way down from middle school all the way up to high school, that you're seeing these little nuances of these generations coming through the pipeline. Definitely. Any other weigh-ins? No? Who's next? Thank you. I'll go here and then I'll work my way back. And I have to stand beside you because of streaming. I'm not trying to creep you out. <laughs> Just because of the mic. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, uh, panelists. So based on what you just said, Casey, uh, regarding preferences and what's motivating um, the younger generations, if you're thinking about retention as an employer, what can you do within your organization to have the younger employees stay around? Because there's a stereotype that they like to move around a lot. So for, um, to retain them, um, you, I think those that are in the workforce and those that are in decision-making positions in the organizations have to change the way they interact with those students. You cannot expect to retain this talent if you're unwilling to change the way you approach them. Quite frankly, Gen Z students think they're mercenaries. They can go to the, the highest bidder, the highest quality of life giver, and they could care less if you're the top employer in the state, they will go work for a mom and pop shop if they give them the flexibility, they give them um, hybrid models to learn and to develop. Um, there is no silver bullet per se, but I think it's a collection of approaches for Gen Z students, or Gen Z uh, talent, um, in order for you to keep them. And that requires that Gen Xers and baby boomers in those positions humble themselves and say, hey, I can learn from the Gen Z students. They're going to bring the creativity. They're going to bring the innovation to my organization to keep my organization viable for this century um, instead of fighting. Because I see a lot of this cultural clashing, the clash of values. Um, and until we solve that, you won't be able to retain that talent. One thing that I would like to add to that, um, we've mentioned flexibility a handful of times here. And flexibility is important, but it's not the end-all, 
be all. People can get dissatisfied in the most flexible environment if they're not having other basic needs met. One thing that I, is very important if you talk with the next generation is they want to feel valued and they want to have buy-in. So it's getting them invested in what you do. Um, it's having committees and councils, it's having leadership opportunities at a very early age to have them feel like they are part of something bigger than them or bigger than the company that you work for. Um, for example, we have something that's called PB Mayor's Day. We close all our offices and go volunteer in the community. Well, that has had to evolve because even millennials, not to mention the next generation, they don't want to be told where they want to go volunteer. They want, to, they want to go volunteer with things that they are passionate about. So giving them a voice, a buy-in, and, and options, an opportunity to speak up is very important. And the other thing that I will say is much like you would treat any one of your stakeholders, and I don't really, I don't think it matters what business you're in, giving, building a relationship with them and listening is going to lead to a much longer retention um, of that given person. And our approach is understanding goals. And we do this with our clients or with our personnel. We have monthly one-to-one -one meetings with direct reports and their supervisors, and this is documented and it's mandatory, to sit down and not discuss net your performance necessarily, but more you as a person and what you're trying to achieve. So if you interact regularly and understand what their short and long-term goals are and what's preventing them from achieving those goals and then providing solutions to those goals, why would they want to leave? It's all about showing that you care and um, getting the buy-in. Um, so I, I think one thing that you can do as well is encourage camaraderie. That's going to build roots within the company. You know, humans are tribal nature. We, we, um, the more opportunities you provide, uh, whether it's, you know, socials or um, wellness activities or team building activities, it breaks down those departmental silos and gets people talking, but it also gets leadership with the front line. And I feel like that's a, a very good way to make people feel valued is they have that opportunity where they may not have um, a reason to go to you know the corner office if you're in what would be switzerland in your meeting room you know having a cocktail you know it's it just calls it it just creates more camaraderie and, and i think we'll root them to the company more so it's um so what i'm hearing is um listening to them giving them opportunities getting them involved and I sat in this presentation about the different generations in the workforce currently and what everybody's looking for and consider a mentorship program. So a lot of, I'm not going to say a lot of, but the older generations, I'm sure, are very inclined to want to do some kind of mentorship with these emerging leaders, people who are eventually going to be in their position at some point in time. So mentorship programs, um, I agree with the monthly one-to-ones. We do the same thing. They are mandatory, and it's about the employee, not necessarily about their performance or what's going on with them, but, hey, where do you, you know, based on what you've told me before, like where you see yourself in five years or so, um, how are you doing with this development plan that we've talked about? You know, what can I do to help you get there? What are those barriers? Okay, let's think about how we can get past them. Um, and you can do some of that with a mentorship program. What we do is called a sponsor program. So anytime a new, we get a new employee, we make sure that we have a sponsor for the first day that they start so they can meet that person and they can talk about what the purpose is of having a sponsor. And that person is, is like a mentor for their, for their training, for the time that they've been training. And then eventually they can move on to another sponsor in another department or just kind of move around depending on where they want to go. So mentorship or sponsorship, however you want to look at that. And really just focusing on what is it that you want and helping them develop that and giving them those opportunities and including them, not just saying, hey, what do you want to do? And then just leaving it on the table, just actually including them and giving them the voice that they want. Beautiful. I'm going to come in the back. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Gary V. He's got a marketing firm. Nobody? You need to look him, look him up. He recently did a podcast and he was asked by a CEO in the crowd, how do you 
define and keep your workplace culture and it was everything that you guys just talked about it was that specific one-to-one -one relationship never ever ever take your eye off of the ball and the ball isn't the growth of your company the ball is your people and knowing every little thing that you can about them in a non-creeping way it's a great <laughs> podcast and also two points of reference uh, check-ins were probably the most famous ones that were started that you guys were talking about is Adobe. So if you look up Adobe and then check-in, you actually can download their check-in process, and it's very much what you guys described, and it's an intentional check-in about the person and about how you're developing them, and the conversation comes off of you as the manager onto the employee, so those are great couple of reference points. You had a question. How should you with personal so people with disabilities, you've all heard many of you heard me say this, represent the greatest untapped talent pool available to our community. And our community really needs that part of the workforce to thrive in the future. And so Casey, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you are doing to prepare people with disabilities, you and others. And then Bo, I know you from a corporate standpoint have come up with some ways that you as an employer may tailor some of what you do to encompass and maximize that talent. Just talk loud till I get there. <laughs> I'll use my teacher voice. So what, um, at New Horizons, we have about 250 uh, students that are uh, severely uh, disabled, uh, whether it's uh, emotionally disabled or students with autism. Um, and what we, what we do, we focus on transition. We, we focus very heavily on building the social skills, um, necessary for them to transition to um, a place of work. What we've noticed, and I know Versability is, is a, one of our great partners with New Horizons, is that students with, with, with autism, they're, they're very good at one or two things. And they can catch, like if you can just imagine like looking at numbers all day for a computer programmer, to me it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to see another number or code. Those students can pick out trends and errors like that because that's what they're looking for. And they have these very heightened skills where all of the rest of us are like, well, I, don't, I can't deal with that. I need to talk with somebody and I need to move around. We focus primarily on transitioning those students from the K-12 system through social skills development um, and content development to fit specific jobs within the workforce that um, other populations would shy away from. Um, so we consider our students with disability, like Kasha said, a viable source of talent to fit specific needs within our workforce. Um, and they have been extremely successful making that transition. There's dignity in that work. They're getting a paycheck just like all the other students that they, they, they like to point out. Um, and there's dignity in all work. And I'm very proud of our partnership with Versabilities and, and using that untapped talent for our workforce. As Kasha alluded to, um, one of our initiatives that has come through our Innovation Council is to utilize untapped resources in the labor force, such as people that are on the spectrum. And it is something that we have only just begun to develop and uncover. But what I did not realize and is that it's not like you have to have a special program. I mean, these people on the spectrum are capable of doing the same jobs that you're posting for the general, the rest of the population. It's just a matter of utilizing those resources and connections. So there are a lot of really good resources locally in the 757, um, not just for um, people on the spectrum that Versability does an excellent job of sourcing, but um, many others as well. And it you would be selling yourself and your organization short if you're not looking in and making yourself known to build partnerships with those organizations to, to leverage those resources. Just as a plug, I went to the phone. Um, and actually, can you pass it down to Angela? You can pipe in. Um, there is a, a program that is between Penn Sherm and the Chamber again that Versability is going to be a part of in speaking. Um, so can you describe that? Oh, the yes. Sherm Initiative yes, as a whole. Um, in the actually wrote that down. So we do have, uh, Sherm National has initiatives um, for developing uh, talent, untapped talent. And one of those initiatives is hiring abilities. Um, so what Penn Sherm, Peninsula Sherm would like to do is have an event with Versability um, to talk about how employers can 
create a program or how they can create strategies for hiring this particular uh, group of individuals. So um, I think we're looking forward to it in June. June 16th, I think, mm -hmm. is the tentative of the morning, so right. mark your calendars. So <laughs> it's always a yes, we want to do it. I hear organizations say, that's, that's what I want to do. How do I actually do it? Like, what are the, how do I, how do I step off and get this program going? So the, the goal of this program is to provide um, everyone in, like, organizations um, the strategies, the steps that they need to take, and then the resources that are available that they can reach out to in order to create this program or a recruiting strategy for hiring abilities. You know, and the other thing there is, thank you, I think there was another question. We'll take one more question, and then we're going to have the, the panel uh, wrap up. But one of the things is that you can, when you talk about the mentor programs and the sponsorship programs, is what a great way to get your new team members involved to buddy up with these new hires that have specific talents. What a great way to immediately get them involved in your own community, your workforce. Uh, Rosanne, hi. So in the financial industry, we have a lot of trends. And so my question is around your organization specifically. What are you doing or are you looking at the unemployment, the low unemployment rates staying the way that they are what initiatives are your company specifically engaging in to bring outside employment into the area, knowing that we have such a shortage of pool and, and we have 757? So have you looked at this from a 10 years ahead, or do you feel your companies are sort of just catching up with the trends that are happening in our economy today? I asked you five loaded questions. Feel free, anybody. <laughs> I, I kind of want to know the answer to all, but one is sufficient. So one of the initiatives that uh, we have in the K-12 system uh, is called the Good Life Solutions Program. Um, and what we're, what we're attempting to do, and we're in the third year of this, of this program, is for organizations to highly consider uh, K-12 talent as a viable pipeline to meet a lot of their workforce needs. Hiring an 18-year-old straight out of high school is a very high-risk proposition for businesses because those students sometimes lack the skills and the maturity to take on some of these high, highly paid, highly skilled jobs. So the Good Life Solutions Program focuses on automotive, manufacturing, construction. Those are the highly need areas in this area. And we have partnered with 56 different businesses locally, and we connect students based on a criteria, they have to have a certain level of GPA, a good attendance record, good behavioral record. And we attach, we, we get them to write their resumes, they apply for jobs with those 56 companies. Those 56 companies offer contingent offers to uh, those students. Right now we have a, about 168 students in the pipeline. New Purdue Shipbuilding already offered 43 jobs to those 168 students. Straight out of high school, they're walking out making 18, 19, 20 dollars an hour. We're also working with Ball Metal. Ball Metal's offering jobs starting at $28 an hour. So we have, we have changed the landscape by uh, partnering with businesses for them to seriously consider the K-12 pipeline as a viable pipeline to meet their needs. So I don't, K-12 doesn't really look out and pull in. We're re really looking at the thousands of students that go through our schools on the peninsula and the south side, keeping them here, keeping uh, to, to minimize the brain drain from this area. Rose, is one of your questions a yes or no? <laughs> I'll, I'll just say yes. No, um, what we tend to do because of the nature of our profession, it's fairly regulated and highly certified with the CPA side of the house at least. The ASCPA and the state societies that we're members of put a ton of resources into looking into the future. How far accounting majors have dropped down in the, um, in the I guess, desired uh, course of business in, in high school and even college is, is dropping. Where cyber and IT services is going extremely high, our profession as a whole is evolving to kind of address what the demographics are looking to do. Um, you know, 10 years from now, I, I can't really speak too much to that, but at least we are utilizing what trends we are seeing to um, evolve our business. I mean, in, in my opinion, I think an individual's tax return may be fully automated in, in 10 years, and you may not need a personal individual tax preparer. You may need the tax planning side, but, you know, 
more importantly than unemployment trends, I think technology trends are going to have a huge impact on what a lot of us in this room do. And that's certainly something that we don't take lightly and we are investing very heavily to ensure that we're on the forefront of it. Any other final comments? You don't have to. That's up to you before I, I pass it back over. Oh, oh, final question. Go for it. Can I use it? Oh, yeah. I'll just yell. Can you hear me back there, Bob? Just this one. Okay. So, so we've talked in, in talking about attracting and retaining the next generation of leaders. We've talked about mostly inside the workplace. So, but what can the 757 do better in the way of, and, and I would like an answer from all four of you, but a real quick answer. <laughs> Entertainment, recreation, dining, sports, things that you do outside of the workplace. What can the Peninsula and the 757 do better? Bo. It's not a yes or no answer. I, can, I think I can project fairly well, but now I'll soften up. Well, there's a bill out there right now that may allow constituents to vote yes or no if there's going to be gambling in their backyard. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be a solution or a deterrent. Um, but as far as the recreation and everything else goes, there are a lot of resources here, and I think the studies have shown that a profession, another professional sports team is not going to be justifiable for economic development. It's more so leveraging what we already have here with the Tides, the Admirals, the Pilots, um, and all the other the sports programs from the entertainment side of the house to, to make it more fun. Um, with Ferguson building their headquarters at City Center, I really think City Center is going to be rejuvenated. All the businesses left the Town Center after Town Center was completed in Hampton, and I'm, I'm really hoping that City Center is going to become a vibrant, very fun place to hang out. Right, Ditto. He forgot, wait, he forgot Lions Bridge <laughs> FC. Oh, yeah, my mother's going to kill me. <laughs> Go ahead, Casey. Well, I was going to say Ditto. Um, I think that we should just leverage what we currently have to attract that talent here. Um, and and I'm, I'm with you. I don't know if uh, another, uh, like an NFL team or NBA team, is really going to make a significant difference to what we currently have here. I mean, we have the beach. We have the beach. We have lots of history here. Of great all of that stuff kind of permeates where, if you go to all the other places, they don't have a, a concoction of all of these different avenues by which to entertain ourselves. Absolutely. I agree. We have the highest concentration of museums in our area. Uh, we have some of the best higher education. Um, the one improvement that I feel that, that we could do, because I think with the environment going the way it is, you're going to see people wanting to be more pedestrian friendly in our cities and, and feeling safe being a pedestrian and biking and things like that throughout the city. So finding those pathways to move around, um, I think, would be very helpful. That's a good point. Um, well, you all already attracted me and my husband here. So, I mean, you're y'all are doing something right. Um, but when you asked that question, Bob, I was thinking about all the things that I enjoy doing and they're they're readily accessible to me. But we talked a lot about branding and marketing and it really goes back to what you all have said as well is um, leveraging what we have and increasing the marketing and brand awareness of what we have on the 757. Um, and then to Holly's point, making it very pedestrian friendly. You know, running at 4.30 in the morning isn't always have a safe feeling. Treadmill. That. No treadmill. <laughs> what do you got? What do you got? You, you put a wrap on it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Can we get a round of applause for our moderator and panel? And, and let me tell you, I loved the, the final answer from all four of them because I've been saying that for a long time. I moved 16 times in 27 years. I've lived on three different continents, both coasts, up and down the East Coast. When I retired, I moved back here because of the great assets in this region. So I loved hearing those answers. And, and, I, and I think that really is the answer. We've got great assets here. Find me a better place. I, I didn't find one in 27 years in the Navy. So uh, help spread the word. You're all ambassadors for the 757. Okay, that was one public service announcement. I got another quick one. Um, Emerging Leaders Society for all the young people, and I was shocked to find out that young means under 40 because I still feel young. Uh, but I'm not eligible for the Emerging Leaders Society. So Emerging Leaders Society, if you're interested in that young professional organization, you can find more information on our website. Um, 
Lead Peninsula. We have 57. Who is in the current Lead Peninsula class? Stand up. Stand up loud and proud. All right. Who, who else in the room is a graduate of the Lead Peninsula program? Stand up. Come on. All right. Okay, now here's the trick question. Who's going to be in next year's class? Everybody else, stand up, right? Because we're going to start taking applications pretty soon. When, Susie? April. All right, so we would love to see you all in that class. And it's Stephanie, fantastic class, right? Best in the region, I can tell you that right now. All right, 28 February, Spotlight on the Peninsula at the Virginia Living Museum. So Spotlight on the Peninsula, the series this year is focused on STEM. So that's going to be a, uh, a great event on 28 February. Please join us. And it's free. And there's food. Uh, 25 April, the first Citizen Gala, the first time we've done that. Um, the winners have already been announced, Charlie and Mary Ann Banks, uh, former CEO of Ferguson and his wife. Uh, and that's 25 April. Please get your tickets soon. Okay. In closing, thanks to our sponsors, our presenting sponsor and annual partner, Bank of America. Thanks to Hans and Michelle, who just showed up a little while ago. Thank or, a little bit after we got started, but they were busy doing the work of the community. Thanks very much for being here. Uh, Peninsula Sherm, great partner. Bob Anderson Media Productions, thank you, Bob, for being here and for being a sponsor. And thanks to all of the rest of you sh for showing up today, and please grab one of my cards on the way out. That's all I got. What else? Wait. Podcast. Peninsula podcast. Biz Buzz podcast can be seen on our website and on LinkedIn. And the latest one just went up with Bob Crum from HRPDC and HRPTO. Um, it's a great podcast because Shelly is the host. So, all right. That's it. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>